Hey guys, welcome to Read It Again's online author series. This week we have the authors of This Is How You Lose a Time War. Um, we got Max, Max Gladstone and um, Amal El... El oh, Matar. Matar, okay. Yeah, so I looked up um, Amal's first name and it's on her Twitter feed. Like, this is how you pronounce it. And so we were just talking how she needs another one to do her last name because she has a beautiful name, but this mouth, mouth butchers it. So, <laughs> so say it properly so everybody can hear it. It's Amal El Motar. This yeah, it's gorgeous. Okay, well, welcome guys. Welcome to read it again. Um, let me let me read your bios real quick, and then we'll dive right in. Um, Amal is an award-winning author and critic. Her short story fiction has won the Hugo Nebula. That was awesome, by the way. And look at the words. While her poetry has won the Riesling Award three times, she is the author of the Honey Mouth. Honey Month. Well, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm bad. Yes. Oh, you um, gotta write that one now. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. I should write something called the Honey Mouth. Sorry. Look, it's it's a great Hulk title. The Island of Dr. Death, the Death of Dr. Island, and the Doctor of Death Island. I feel like you know, <laughs> you're just teeing it up for yourself. Girl, the girl on the trains, or girl on the <laughs> girl here, girl there. Anyway, okay, yeah. back to work. So, Professions, um, female <laughs> relative. My, sorry, I'll stop. Please <laughs> introduce us. <laughs> Okay, collection of poetry and prose written to the taste of 28 different types of honey. I, by the way, am obsessed with honey. Um, these are the shoes I wore today. I love them! Oh, man! Those are great! Okay, um, let me put my shoe back on. Um, uh, okay, writes for other Wordly column for the New York Times Best, uh, New York Times Book Review. She's a co-author with Max and, and this, uh, of This Is How You Lose a Time War, an epistolary time travel spy versus spy novel. Nobel. Okay, not Max. <laughs> okay. Max Gladstone is a fencer, a fiddler, and a Hugo Award finalist. He taught English in China, wrecked a bicycle in Angkor Wat, which we were catching up before this because I've been to Angkor Wat too. Anyway. Um, and has been thrown from a horse in Mongolia. Max lives and writes in, um, I'm just gonna say some Massachusetts because you just moved, right? Um, near Boston, he was the author of the craft series, which I read the first one when it first came out a long time ago. So. Great. Um, anyway, welcome guys. <laughs> <laughs> Happy so, to be here. Um, you guys, oh, we already have comments. If you guys have a comment, make it, and I will post it the video. Oh, hi, Scott. Sonia says- Hi, Sonia. Sonia's my buddy. Hi, Sonia. Okay. Um, so you guys yeah, just not much fencing mm -hmm. these days, unfortunately. <laughs> oh. Why not? Well, I mean, well, for one thing, you know, we, we had a kid last year, which makes it very hard to get to the thing. And for the other thing, there's the uh, omni catastrophe. <laughs> um, so you know, remain <laughs> indoors and all that. Hi, Scott. Too. <laughs> I keep the okay. secret. Um. <laughs> So many people. Hi, everybody. Keeps here. Keep saying hi. Um, you guys this is just delightful. I've never done this before. This is so good. I it's know. Like I've only ever watched like Streamyard uh, streams, and it's like it's just so seamless. It's really enjoyable. Um, let's see here. Uh, what was I saying? Oh, so you guys just won um, the Nebula for this. Congratulations. God, that, that is a real thing that happened, which yeah. I had <laughs> like, like two weeks ago. I looked surprised. It's like, oh my God. Yeah, that happened in the same month that we are presently in. That's, yeah. that's amazing. Two weeks. Two weeks? One week? Two weeks? Two weeks. Two we weeks we moved house. So this has also been extremely temporarily dislocating on top of all of the usual temporal dislocation. I, I don't even know what year we're in at this point. No, I know what year we're in. <laughs> But oh, like nobody's gonna forget this year. <laughs> Seriously. Let's see. Um so it was funny because um <laughs> uh, that's very clever. Fiddling for writing. <laughs> the F is silent. Free writing. Yeah, maybe, <laughs> I guess. I don't know. Um so my book club, we read this, the sci-fi book club here at Read It Again, one of the best book clubs ever, probably the best book club ever. And then I have a friend group who also read it for their book club. So um, one of my friends from the book club was like, oh my gosh, you need to tune in right now to the Nebula Awards. And I put it on just as you guys were like starting your, um, uh, thank you. Our flail. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
Oh man, it was it was an amazing. It was like I have to say, extreme kudos to everyone who r- ran the nebulas this year and who made it what it was because it, like, it genuinely felt like being at an event with a whole bunch of other people. And uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I think also, if I'm not mistaken. Um, they're still using all of that fantastic technology and and like the the volunteer pool that they had together to have a a reading series. So like the good ship Nebula is still sailing, as it were, and you can still um, I am I can't actually give any information for how to do this. Perhaps someone in the chat can do so. Uh, but uh, but anyway, it's just it was a a truly amazing event, and um, and you know we did not know <laughs> ahead of time or anything that anything was going to happen like that so it was fully enormously tense it's just such a rush i mean it's yeah. a great slate of nominees this year and um, we were just so blown away to get a chance to i don't know except on behalf of the book is almost what it feels like more than anything else especially with this one because it's something that we did together mm-hmm. and it has its own aura to it i guess not to get all benjamin over the thing but it's our fusion book. Yes, like, that's true. I love it. That's what we thought about it as back in the day, and it's really become that. I think. Okay, before we get much further, why don't you guys give us kind of a synopsis about the novella? Sure. Go for it, Max. Okay, all right. Excellent. My turn for this one. Um, so this is, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you, could, you could do it. A friend of mine uh, once came up with an idea for uh, correspondence rock, paper, scissors. It took him a little while to realize. Oh, yeah, this is, of course, Bob this rock, paper, scissors. A buddy of mine said, it, it'll never work. And my friend says, no, no, no. It's uh, Honestly, I got, I got an idea. So he goes over to his computer and he sends an email. And uh, my other friend checks his, says, check your email. And my other friend checks his email. And he has an email that just says, rock. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, uh, not the most, maybe the most zen thing that has ever happened in, in my life. You know, and, and the classic sort of John Stewart version. Anyway, um, <laughs> This is How You Lose the Time War is a story about two women who are on, two post-human women who are on different sides of a multiverse spanning conflict to, between two vastly advanced civilizations that are trying to rewrite all of history, all of the past and all of the future in order to ensure that one or the other of them is the only dominant possibility for the end of history. So you have these two women who have been on either sides of this conflict for centuries. They are the finest secret agents, warriors that their sides have ever produced. And they meet on opposite sides, thwarting each other and become very interested. Both of them are a little bored with the war. They've um, they sort of outclassed most of their adversaries and all of a sudden they find themselves paying attention. And then one of them leaves a letter, a sort of taunting note on a burned out far future battlefield. And all of a sudden they have a correspondence. It's the story of their relationship as it grows and changes through the letters. Okay, so mm. h- how, I think, I think Ben, Ben, you're going to ask the next question? Yeah, he says yes. Hi guys, this is, um, this Hello. is Ben Soff. he belongs to our book, Hi. and he has a question for you guys. Hello, with the mic on. <laughs> <laughs> My question Hello. today comes to you from the back of your book, actually. Looking this whole time, there were questions. <laughs> oh no. It says Eganography. That it, <laughs> and this cannot possibly be a spoiler because it's written right in the back of the book for those who haven't read it. Red belongs to the agency, a post-singularity technotopia. Either I just didn't pay attention enough or it wasn't in there. Did you actually say in the book it was a post-singular Singularity Technotopia, or was that maybe something from the the Bible or the canon that you surely must have come up with to write a collaborative book that maybe the publisher saw and put in the back of the book, but we never actually got in the book? <laughs> That's I my think, question. I think that um, I think that the parts in the book that refer to 
those aspects are, I think, in, in two points. One, Red says to Blue, Red calls Blue's world a viney, hivey elf world, and Blue calls Red's a techie, mechy dystopia. Uh, and both of those are quite tongue in cheek. And uh, I think the, po I don't think the word singularity ever comes up in the book. I think, I think that is correct. <laughs> exactly. I think we could probably say that. But it definitely was part of our conversations about how, about in what ways are the two futures opposite? Because we actually didn't want it to be as, um, we, we didn't want it to be as kind of simple as tech versus like nature. Because once you read Timothy Morton, once you, you cease to be able to talk about nature. Never will it dominate <laughs> your destiny. Exactly. Um, so just like, you know, the, the <laughs> idea of like ecology contains humans, that whole sort of thing. Um, but what we decided, what we wanted the duality to be was about consciousness that was embedded and consciousness that was abstracted. Uh, so, you know, post-singularity became a kind of shorthand for that, uh, instead of instead of actually saying those things, um, yeah, and, and I mean that's yeah. that's heavily implied in the way that Red System works, right? Mm -hmm. You she talks about swapping bodies, and most people in her world spending most of their time in these kind of matrix-like pods that they're not actually going out and doing things physically; they're projecting themselves throughout the cosmos. Yeah. Similarly, you get a sense that um, the agency's moves are heavily planned, that there are some guiding intelligences that aren't really um, accessible to or present for the individual agents. Um, the question always with trying to render anything post-singularity, and then this also applies to gardens for that matter, is mm -hmm. um, how do you portray, um, how do you portray a universe that has crossed a major boundary like that? Frankly, whether it's, whether you're talking about a technological singularity or a or a religious singularity, like with Teilhard. Um, and one of the ways that we're cheating in both directions, maybe cheating, one of the ways that we're finessing it is by the fact that the agents and the operatives, both um, red and blue, need to go back in the past and be able to interact with humans, aliens, entities that are that have not already crossed this boundary. So they need to be um, individuals, they need to be comprehensible creatures mm -hmm. in order to operate the way they, they're supposed to. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And also, a, a thing that I, um, I think we've both said before is that everything, I mean, when, when Max says cheating, uh, which is a shorthand that we both use for the shorthand that we both use uh, in the books and stuff, uh, is that well, there's um, there's a very just deliberate choice that we made that we wanted uh, we wanted everything about the war and the vastness and stuff to be a backdrop to the relationship between the two characters, mm -hmm. uh, so that it's very much a two-hander that by doing so allows us to just kind of have all of the. Um, like we're, to try and have all of time and space be glimpsed like, you know, scenery on a train, you know, as you kind of, you're just, it's, it's going by real fast and every now and then you look towards it and you see something and then you kind of go back to the book that you're reading. So <laughs> on the I read this book two and a half times. And the first time I read it twice in one day and it took me a minute to realize that the background wasn't important to stop trying to like pay attention to everything you mentioned. Cause I'm like, oh, this is gonna come up later. This, they're building, you know, they're world building. I gotta pay attention. And yeah. it wasn't until I got like, I don't know, almost halfway through, I was like, okay, it's not important. I'm just gonna ignore what's going on in the background and just focus on what they say to each other. Yeah, I mean, with anything that's character driven and especially with this book, you're relying on the characters to carry you through the world. Now, I could sit down with a three-ring binder. I could write you first a three-ring binder that explains why everything makes sense and what's happening in all of these different <laughs> realities and that. what texts are... Well, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's the... Let me see. So part of the reason that we, we didn't is that this book is in some ways anthologizing or drawing from the whole breadth and depth of science fiction and fantasy for that matter and, and historical fiction. So there are tropes and characters that we're referencing offhand as a grace note 
And if you understand or if you get the textual reference, then, oh, okay, all of a sudden I'm there. But if you're not, the question is, how, um, how do you navigate the book? And the answer that we settled on is, this is really the story of these two characters. Anyone who picks up the references is going to be able to see how they connect. And anyone who is re really used to the particular sort of old school science fictional game of taking tiny little hints about how a world assembles and extrapolating from that to a complete sense of the society and culture will be able to do that too. But for people who are coming for the characters, for people who don't have those particular reading protocols or skill sets, they're still going to be able to follow red mm -hmm. and blue and understand them enough to enjoy the book, to go on the journey with them. So At least that was our hope. Bernard, yeah. we're going to say goodbye to you. Thanks for asking a question. Thanks for answering. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Okay, so Layla had a question here, and I think it's a good one. Did you both eat a dictionary, burn it, <laughs> bring it in the ass, <laughs> old fashioned? What is that? <laughs> oh, wait. I think I pulled my headphone out slightly. Apologies. <laughs> that was great. Yeah, okay. Bargain great. with the devil for your amazing vocabulary. That That's an excellent question. <laughs> Thanks, um, did we? I let, yeah. Uh, I, are we allowed to reveal this information? I'm not sure. I feel like uh, what did the crossroads say when we were at them? <laughs> there was, I'm sure, there was some. It's all you know. It's fine print. You know, I'm sure it's <laughs> not important, right? How how bad could it be? <laughs> and, and, uh, so uh, Carlos has a question. Um, he's coming from Miami. Turn your you ready, Carlos? Join in here. Yeah. We go. Hey, Carlos. Hey, how Hello. are you? Hello. Welcome. Yeah. So we are an international book club. Um, we have members in Florida, and we have members in Taiwan. And this like, is so cool. Layla, my Layla name. asked the question. She, she, it's morning where she is right now in Taiwan. I think my oh, my wow. youngest brother is in Taiwan right now, actually. Oh. Uh, yeah, he's the technology is being, I'm just going to shout out to him for a second. He's definitely not watching this, but he did also just pass the uh, the New York bar remotely from Taiwan, like literally this morning. So, wow. uh, and it was, so I'm extremely proud of him and, uh, wow. uh, and yeah, cool. Anyway, he's there. Okay, Carlos, what was your question? Very cool. Well, um, yeah, thank you for having me. So I just wanted to ask uh, your favorite time travel influences, books or movies, what inspired you? This is so different from the traditional Back to the Future movie, right? So <laughs> tell us, what, what did you, what inspired you? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I can jump in and say I, um, I grew up super, super loving Doctor Who. Uh, I and it was, it was probably my earliest um, time travel thing, uh, which I started reading. I, I I was introduced to Doctor Who via the novelizations, the like the Terrence Dix novelizations, um, uh, when I was like seven, and I was living in Lebanon at the time. And my uh, my dad's cousin had like a a shelf full of Doctor Who books, so I had no idea it was a TV show because it was just books, and like the you know the the covers were stylized in such a way that it didn't look like it was drawings of the of the characters and stuff. So I uh, managed to preserve the innocence about that until literally the reboot with Chris Reckleston. Like when that show happened, I started really excitedly talking to all my friends and saying, oh my God, like there are these books that I read when I was a kid and they're making them into a TV show. It's like the most amazing thing. Uh, and then they very gently explained the history of Doctor Who to me. <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, I had the same experience with the novels, though. Um, it's not, you know, I, I got a couple of them out of um, the local library and was in love with them. And then an um, older friend of my parents introduced me to the Tom Baker, who, uh, like, when I was still in high school. So that was my sort of AV imprint. But I read the the, the novelization of the five doctors before I'd ever seen a single episode of Doctor Who, which was a very weird experience. I still have in my, like emblazoned in my memory, uh, like the, the first, I'm pretty sure the first Doctor Who book that I read was uh, Planet of the Daleks. And I, 
like there are things from that book that like just like lines like the like joe at some point eats a sour fruit and the the way that the fruit is described like just totally stayed with me but the thing that stayed with me the most from that book was that the doctor explains to someone the difference between courage and bravery and like i was seven i didn't know that those were different things this was like a really a really formative moment and if you're wondering the difference is that when like bravery is like the absence of fear, but courage is being afraid and doing the thing anyway. And like that just, just it, it moves, it, it still moves me to remember it. At the time, I'm sure I was more like, oh, than I was like, <laughs> but um, it's, but anyway, Doctor Who, an early influence for sure. Um, the, the thing about influence is like, I don't feel like, um, I mean, so Max and I definitely talked about what kind of time travel we wanted the book to have. Um, and that was sort of independent of the time travel stuff that we super liked. I mean, like I, I love a broad range of time travel narratives, but we had to figure out what time travel narratives were the ones that we were going to kind of use for the story that we wanted to tell. So uh, the main difference for <laughs> exterminate, aw, yes. Um, the, the main uh, thing that we wanted to decide was whether we wanted like a closed loop, um, st closed stable time loop travel sort of thing, or if we wanted to have timelines that branched okay. off. Multiverse, yeah. Yeah, multiverse stuff. Sorry, Max. Yeah, right. multiverse and meta time. No, I mean, so the, I'm getting some science fiction historian is going to get on my case about missing like the actual origin of this trope, but the the earliest um, that I can think of is probably Fritz Leiber's The Big Time, which is one of the first like big sort of pillar works of the uh, of the change war genre. The notion that you have people who are trying to like time travelers are trying to fight each other to um, to, to successfully alter history. Um, I think it's David Levine who wrote this, uh, the Wikipedia edit timeline story. Do you remember him, Al? This is like back in 2007 or eight. Oh yeah, so that was Andrea Phillips's. Um, was, yeah, it was uh, called- Was it Andrea's? Yeah, yeah. Um, oh oh God, gosh, it was oh such a God. great book. It was such a great book. Uh, oh no, 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 no. That's the new one, the, 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 the future of another timeline, right? No, that's Annalie Newitz. No, that's Annalie Newitz. No. no, Andrea had one that I think was called Re Re Revisions. Um, okay. Let me just look this up because I totally reviewed this. Uh, oh, amazing. I'm looking and, up yeah, it's called Revision um, or Revision. Uh, and um, it's by Andrea Phillips. Sorry, but if it's not what you were thinking of, then it's just- it's No, a, I don't another... think so. I'm thinking of a short, of a, of a short story, like something that's oh, okay. basically in the format of the Wikipedia um, talk page. Oh, sorry, where sorry. People are arguing about like who's, whether there's basically a tired mod who keeps coming and trying to stop people from assassinating Hitler oh um, <laughs> for various reasons. You know, it's, it's a funny story, but but I, I think between that and future of another timeline and and Andrea's, um, I, or there's sort of this like Wikipedia history vision that uh, oh. of time travel that sort of emerged around the time that wikis became a thing. Right. Um, yeah, like a whole different way to think about what history is. So you know that's that, that's something that um, it's important for me. There, are a, there's a a game, the name of which I'm forgetting. It's a Steve Jackson little card game where you um, have a whole bunch of events throughout history played out as cards, and then you are um, playing different time travelers with different goals. Like hmm. there's uh, one of your goal, one of your, and they're all from different futures. Yes, true, good point. Um, so the time travelers are all um, coming in from different futures with different objectives. So there's, for example, a giant irradiated cockroach time traveler who <laughs> wants to ensure that World War III happens because that's how the giant irradiated sentient cockroaches come and win and they do a better job, say the cockroaches, than the rest of us. I mean, so, I for one welcome our new irradiated cockroach overlords. I yeah, I know, right? <laughs> a minor improvement I, over our... <laughs> Anyway, whoops. Our current um, irradiated yes. overlord. Um, <laughs> current, exactly. Current, oh, sorry, I should stop. Um, but yeah, uh, okay. it, it's, it's interesting to me how, I mean, influences are kind of nonlinear and unexpected in a lot of ways. Like mm -hmm. uh, the, um, not only do you start pulling from games and stuff that doesn't generally come up in a, uh, in the science fiction influences conversation, <laughs> like, 
Also, for me, and this is the most pretentious thing I'm going to say on the internet this evening, like Proust is a really strong influence for thinking about time travel and our own experience of writing letters to one yeah. another was a strong influence on how we structured time travel. These notions of time saved, transferred, um, the way that you're kind of, the conversation that Red and Blue have about imagining the other party who's receiving the letter, mm -hmm. reading it, and um, that that is itself a kind of act of time travel. Yeah. Um, it's an imaginative act of time travel. Well, actually, that's that leads into what epistolary. Yes. Uh, yeah. Because yeah. yeah, I love epistolary novels uh, or books. Chrononauts. Yes. Yes. I'm sorry. I just saw yeah. on the. Oh, that's on the private chat. Nobody. Yeah, can see that's that. okay. Very private chat. Right. Um, Chrononauts is in fact the name of the board game. Oh, great. <laughs> so, I was going to add uh, one quick thing, um, yeah. just in terms of like time travely narratives. I don't know if anyone else has read this. It's one of those things that. Uh, I'm just gonna say, has anyone read Homestuck? Like Homestuck was actually really, really important and meaningful to me uh, during a difficult period of time. Um, but it was it was an online, it, it's finished, it, it exists on the internet. Um, it's a sort of multimedia webcomic experience uh, situation that um, is really, really interested in uh, deterministic models of time travel and how you can escape those with a narrative and stuff like that. So, which you makes never it got past like the computer game segment or something. I think I tried to start it and then did not get very far because I'm bad at home stuff. <laughs> I, I honestly like it's it's one of those things where for a long time while I was reading it, I could recommend it. And then it sort of passed that point where it became a sort of, it's like, you know, I don't, I actually have no idea if this is true about celery, but that, that like you expend more calories consuming it than it gives you. Um, but it's, it became metaphorical celery at, that, at some point, yeah. but uh, I still have a lot of fondness for um, a lot of it. And certainly like, I mean, it, this is very embarrassing. It taught me a lot about physics. <laughs> and- uh, I don't know what you think about physics. I bet Carlos yeah. does. So speaking of Carlos, Carlos, I'm gonna say goodbye to you. Thanks for joining us. Nice to meet you, Carlos. Nice to meet you, Carlos. I didn't wanna cut us off about the epistolary question, mm -hmm. though, Sorry, yeah. so I will cop to that's exactly what I did. Like, it's, <laughs> oh, no, it's, okay. it's okay, just All jump right. in. No, I, I love epistolary novels. Uh, 84 Charon Cross Place is like my all time favorite book. Um, you guys should look it up. I'll post it here. Um, but I've had a couple of people ask, how, how did you write this? Where's that question? I'm sure you guys get that all the time because it's it's so beautifully, beautifully interwoven that I want to know just how. I love telling this story. It's a um, great story. Like, so um, basically the, so the, the, how did we write this? Where to, where to start? Do you have a starting point that you want to start at, Max? Man, um, oh, so we had known each other for a little while and become good friends largely through writing each other letters. Um, you know, the internet is a scary and very strange place. And I think for both of us, we were really enjoying sitting down with pen and paper and the, the sort of wonderful pageantry and ritual of it. Mm -hmm. Actually writing down what you're thinking about, imagining somebody else opening the letter and receiving it. And then the fact that this is all, like there's no sent items folder, it leaves your hand, it leaves your house, and then you're relying on other humans to take it step by step across a border, in this case, uh, to the person that you're writing towards. Um, so we were, we, we loved that process of writing. And as we were becoming acquainted, we also read each other's books and were extremely excited by them and thought, well, we really need to make something happen together. We need to make something happen together that would um, allow us both to be ourselves fully. There's always a challenge with collaboration. If you're working with people who have different styles, then one natural tendency is to try to find a sort of joint style, which sometimes can be truly stunning, mm -hmm. but sometimes can involve leaving the special characteristics of each person's individual style at the 
store, you end up with the overlap of the Venn diagram. And we really wanted the, the whole thing. We wanted to be intensifying one another's work, but also to be able to be, um, you know, as weird as we were in our own writing. Um, and so the notion of a two-handed story where each narrator could bring themselves completely to the table, where the characters would have very different perspectives um, that felt more natural to each of us. It really sprung from that. And then the actual physical scenario of how to write it <laughs> is a whole other story, which I will now pass to him now. <laughs> so um, I love that we're two-handedly telling the story of how we two-handedly wrote this book. It's great. Um, if, the, if the narrative fits, I guess. So, um, so we had decided a few things at the outset about uh, about writing something together that were purely logistical. That were like, we are both very busy people. Um, we, what are we going to write together? Well, it can't be a novel. We thought we were busy read. back then. Yeah, that's so true. We had so much time. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. Um, so yeah, uh, we. Uh, Oh my, I'm sorry to just sit with that for a second. Yeah, I know. I, uh, you know it, it settles on one. You know? it's, <laughs> it's like when you're playing a video game and you remember back when you thought monsters were hard at like the previous level. And then anyway, but it's fine. Um, yeah, no, I, I got that thing in, um, in Slay the Spire the other day when you're on the third level yes. and you're like, and it gives ah. you like the, do you want to fight a boss from act one for a relic? And you're like, oh yeah, sure. And then you just, go through them like tissue paper exactly Great. i always Great. love that i always feel like i'm cheating when i choose that option i anyway, say the spire excellent game incidentally um <clears throat> so the thing was that we had uh, set out these parameters for ourselves where we were like okay a novel is too long to write we should write a novella like half a novella each that seems reasonable um we are gonna have two voices like max said um uh, we should probably have some letter element because we loved writing letters um and then like we, uh, we we were sort of talking about the project as a, a very aspirational thing. Like we would, we, we, like we, we figured at some point we would do this. Then we were given, uh, we were invited to take part at a writing retreat um, that was going to be kind of sandwiched between two cons um, in the Midwest. And, uh, and we were like, okay, we have the time. We're both gonna be at this writing retreat. So we're gonna have a, about two and a half weeks all right, we should probably start talking about the thing. So we started talking again, leading up to it about like the novella that we would write in this anonymous benefactor's house. And then, uh, and it became this kind of like refrain for us. When we actually got there, um, we fell into this rhythm of, we were gonna wake up every morning, make some coffee, have some breakfast, go out to the gazebo in the garden uh, with no internet and sit across from each other with our respective, uh, laptops and we were going to write the thing at the same time. Um, so we decided we decided on the um, that we were going to each write all of one character. So Max would write all of red and I would write all of blue. Uh, and one of us would write the letter while the other one was writing the situation in which the letter would be received. And we would discuss the situation, uh, but we would not discuss the letter itself like we wouldn't discuss its content so the the letter was always you discuss a the form of the letter also right yeah, so, yeah. exactly like the form like the, the when i say the situation in which it's received it's like okay yeah so what like how what is the letter is it is it is it tea is it a tree trunk this time is it uh, a bird you know that sort of thing um and we we wanted to know that because that way the person writing the letter could reflect on the physicality of the thing that they were sending and we wouldn't be contradicting ourselves um so the idea was that we would be writing these sections at the same time. This was a great idea in theory. In practice, what it meant uh, was that we discovered that Max writes almost exactly four times as fast as I do. So, uh, and also in this gazebo, there was uh, a, an, like a, an amazingly sturdy keyboard from, you know, yesteryear with a lot of travel in the keys. So I could always hear exactly how much more and faster <laughs> Max was writing than me, because it sounded like <laughs> um, and, uh, and and so, and I was like, do, 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 things, stuff, 
beautiful summer day thing stuff. Um, so at first, Max would uh, like write his section and then wait for me to finish what I was writing. And I would always end up having like the, a slightly shorter section, Max would have a slightly longer section. But the beautiful thing that started happening was, uh, so when we do this, we'd swap laptops, read what we'd written, swap them back and keep going. But by about the second act, I started speeding up and Max started slowing down. And we were suddenly, or not suddenly, but gradually, we, we found that we were finishing our sections at exactly the same time without any coordination, without any, like we were just done, look up, you're done, oh my God, okay. And like swap and read it, go, this is amazing. And then swap them back. And it was just, it became like a choreography. It became like this, this this beautiful thing happening to us as much as anything else that as, as we were kind of matching each other's pace, we also started to find our styles blending. And there were things that Max was doing that gave me confidence to, to put into my work that I might not have felt confident about otherwise. And, um, and I think Max, you were saying the same thing. Oh yeah, like, yeah, oh, absolutely, vice versa. I mean, there was, there's a this wonderful friendly competitive element of like, oh that was so good maybe I can can I make something that was that good um, and also just the freedom that working with your writing gave me to go deeper or more emotional um, in my own work which is like well it, it's you know everybody has strengths and weaknesses and that's something that it always felt maybe I think even a little scary to me which I though I hadn't recognized it at the time oh <laughs> time dilation <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> um so that was mostly how so I should to to say too like during those um 10 days or so 10 days two two weeks two and I, I think it was time. 10 10 12 Maybe twelve days. It was Maybe less than days. two weeks. I remember. Because less than was, two weeks. That's what it was. Yeah, we there were like a couple lost days. Yeah. Yeah. So not so important. Over those over those two days, we wrote about um, like almost thirty thousand words of of the novella together. So uh, like three of five acts that we had planned, and then um, this other thing happened that I I in retrospect. I'm, I'm slightly amazed by it. like we figured okay well we wrote a bunch of it now we'll be able to pick it up like over email or something later that that I was never... nervous about this I was nervous yeah, about this yeah exactly <laughs> and because like, we could do it you know probably yeah it's, that's not what happened we ended up writing the entirety <laughs> of it like when we were in the same place and so we had like I think two further occasions of being in the same place. Once was at World Fantasy, uh, the World Fantasy Convention in Columbus, Ohio in 2016. And the um, and the other time was a, I went down to Boston to visit Max for a few days and uh, uh, and we, we finished it there basically. And the, so it, like, it was just that it really felt like the experience that we'd had uh, at the writing retreat was one that we kept wanting to kind of return into every time we picked up work on it again. Um, it just didn't, it didn't feel, it never felt to me like something that I could do separately from you, Max. Like, it, like if we were both separately on our own time, you know, just writing a section, which is ironic because it's of course letters. You know, like the, the book is made of letters, but we were sitting we've across from each a other. A lot of letters to ourselves, to, to each other. I mean, so yeah. you'd think that we'd be able to just move that energy, but no, there was something really uh, intense about the physical proximity. Exactly. I think that's also, you know, part of the characters' relationship too. They're they're like intensely with and against each other. Mm -hmm. um, exactly. Exactly. How did you guys come up with like the inspiration? Like, oh, this letter is going to be in a tree, and this one is going to be in a bee sting, and this one's going to be in poison. Like, we totally on the spot. Yeah, yeah. I've never seen anything like that before, and I mean, I've read a lot of books, and they're <laughs> cool. Well, we we talked about we talked about spy stuff um, mm. a little bit um, before we 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 ratcheted in. You know, the spy um, inspiration for these this book is um, the spy versus spy as much as it is anything else. Um, but you know, we wanted to have a little bit of that feeling, and so we were talking about different ways that you could hide writing um, mm -hmm. and steganography hidden writing is one of those you you know you put writing where people are not going to notice that it's writing whether that's 
you know, hiding it in the Fibonacci sequence, sequence uh, letters on a classified ads page or something like that. But that gets much more interesting if you have control of time. Mm -hmm. So what kind of notes could you hide for someone using time travel? You could create a situation where only on one particular day or on one particular hour was the message visible or would it even exist at all? You can set up flowers to bloom. Right, yeah. To grow. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. So like who who would hide a letter there? Well, you know, if you could come back and visit the tree every year for a century and that wasn't a big problem for you, then, mm -hmm. you know, that was, so we, we talked about what kind of adventurous, strange kind of boundary pushing mm -hmm. things we could come up with, ways to hide letters, interesting mm -hmm. ways for a letter to be delivered. When so the last light of Duran's day shines on the keyhole. Yeah, right, you know, right. You know, like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's it exactly and that, that one's a fairy tale character to the whole thing too i think yeah yeah so if we lived in fahrenheit 451 Aww, reality, thank you oh! <laughs> that's the Where's sweetest the thing be the book that i would memorize yes uh, that's the really kindest good. thing thank you wow. so much Layla. <laughs> Layla's texting me by the way she's like they mentioned me they mentioned me <laughs> <laughs> Layla, i also want to say uh like i just you know just happy to see you. my mom's name is Layla, uh and oh. like it just like my, my mom's name is Layla. you're in the same country as my brother it's just like yeah just noticing these things it's cool <laughs> connections <laughs> and there was another question i wanted to ask um uh, let's see what's this the text-based letters are written to be written in person. Yeah. Yes. It would have yeah. been much more convenient if that weren't the <laughs> case, but it turned out that. It is true. Uh, has the act of collaboration, uh, creative effects affected your work of solo since any ripple effects? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, I, um, how can I, I mean, actually, Max, you've done, a, you've done a lot more writing than I have. Since uh, since we wrote this together, well, Max has written. You've done a lot of writing. Three, You've written right? a lot of yeah. Stuff. Max has written two novels. Three two. Three novels since we wrote Time War. When three did you novels. Write, when did you write Time War? We wrote Time War uh, over the course of 2016, but the writing retreat happened in like June, I think. June, yeah, like end of June 2016. And we finished it by November, or no, sorry, by December of that year. Uh, meanwhile, you wrote Empress. So this is, this is, yeah, this is going to be bad. Um, I wrote, I wrote the, the Pathfinder project that nobody's ever going to see. That, that wasn't technically done before December. So I, I finished. So yeah, so Empress, the, the new craft book was done then, right? The first draft was done after that. Uh, are you talking about uh, um, the- Because this is uh, 2016. So yeah, yeah, um, Dead Country or, or whatever it ends up being called. The an uh, uh, angel, uh, Ruin of Angels. No, 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 no. Oh. Did I write Ruin? Shit, did I write Ruin also? No, I, think I, can't, I can't. No, Ruin was before. Sorry, you're right. <laughs> Okay, yeah, There's no, so, so many. so and then and then um and then uh and then last exit or whatever that ends up being called yeah. like three ish. I'm pretty sure you What's wrote three novels wow. be between between the end of Time War and now. You've written three novels. And so like I think you are better positioned. I have I have written this is very upsetting actually to think about it this way. I have written a lot of things that were not stories, but I, I wrote like you also got like grad school and teaching and stuff. Yeah, it's true. I have I have other I have several other pursuits that are not the writing of fiction, but um, but still, um, I, I mean, I can say that definitely, like the the ways in which I feel you, I think that working with you has affected my teaching as well. Like I feel like there's a lot of stuff that I learned from our collaboration that. Um, that I, I'm carrying forward into teaching and into the way that I think about fiction more generally and stuff. Um, <clears throat> in terms of like the stuff that's on the page, um, I, I, I was like trying to, I think I said this and I'm trying to remember when I said this, but that's really not important. I feel like I went into the collaboration uh, with my writing being like trying to look very closely at the inside of a shell 
And then after working with you, I started to try like looking up at the beach, like around and stuff. And it just, it, it feels like that that is the biggest effect for me is feeling myself outside of the writing and feeling myself outside of the, the scene that I'm trying to set and stuff like that, instead of like really deeply embedded in a prose line. <laughs> I <laughs> I work combo. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, that's, true. that's true. I did do that. Yeah, I, yeah. I we, enjoyed, we really enjoyed that. We, we, oh, you yeah. read that? <laughs> yeah. We did. Oh. We we loved your book. So we we did research like independent. Oh my God. So, and we, 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 we thought that um, reading this, this is a book that should be taught. Like they should teach it in class in in, in college because Thank it you. made us want to like analyze it and I mean we wanted to look at the micro picture and then look at the macro picture mm -hmm. you know it just we really did feel that some professors should teach it. She, so. Aww, thank you. Thank you. Everybody does that. It was my idea. <laughs> so it seems like the different scenes were just there so you can invent ways for red and blue to encode letters. Yeah, I mean. Not, not not untrue. Um, I think that's what the, true. Well, it's it's it's, it's some of, some of that and some of this other thing. Um, the scenes are opportunities for you know for letters to be delivered in really interesting ways. They're also chances for us to see the characters operating, mm -hmm. which tells you an enormous amount, even when they're being pretty closed off about who they are, what they want, where they're coming from, how they relate to their own side's goals. We, we just see them in action. Mm -hmm. um, they, they convey character the way a dancer does by through movement. Um, and that's, I think, vital because the characters are not just the people that they are in the letter. That they're sort of summoning and they're wrestling with as they're trying to send them to even when to somebody else. Even when that person becomes you know, a friend or a sort of friend adversary that they trust or somebody that they love. Uh, we also stand back and see them waiting um, and wondering and wondering when the next letter is going to come, if another letter is going to come, is it here, is it here? Uh, and we see how they change over time with that expectation. Uh, so to my mind, anyway, the, the inner content is vital. Um, we weren't I think I think the external content, the you know whether this scene is a, is in Atlantis or in the far future or Caesar, is um, in some ways more of a reflection of the emotional need of the moment, which was again kind of by design. The time travel element allowed us to have that freedom. Absolutely, and also I think that there is uh, an an increasing kind of intimacy to the physical yeah, media sure. of the letters. When we start out, um, there like we're still very much into the kind of spy craft aspects where it's like here, you know, burn before reading, burn after reading, and so on. Uh, like trying to um, di literally have a cipher script made out Field of letters. random numbers and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and uh, and and things that are like you know, here, I'm going to write you a letter in the bones of the asset that you were supposed to save, haha, -ha. you know, that sort of thing. Totally, totally normal, totally like not gay. Is it, is it, huh. is, it, that was, is, is, gay. it is it gay to send someone a letter in the bones of the person they were, so, anyway, mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm so punchy tonight. I'm just taking like, no, be no, gay, what? do crimes to, to, mm -hmm. totally. In, in, be, gay, do, be gay, do time crimes. New time yeah. crimes. Yeah, sorry. you mentioned it being intimate, but this book's extremely intimate. It's yeah, yeah. But so this is the thing. It's like the the at first the, those media that they're interacting with, they're interacting with in a way that doesn't you know demand as much. By the time like in order to read the letter, you have to actually eat the letter, consume the letter. Um, I feel like there is like th that is inviting a different kind of interaction and stuff. Um, and uh, and I think that like. There was there was definitely a feeling as we were trying to figure out because we'd always like go okay so what should the letter be this time you know like what how how should it appear and we wanted to try and not repeat things we wanted to try but we also it wasn't just about having like um a, a like a pantheon of differences it was also kind of about like well what is what are we feeling at this point you know what um yeah sort of thing. Mm -hmm. 
So Sonia had a question. Oh, first this one. The myth about the celery is I... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good metaphor. It is a good metaphor. It's like it's like the whole frog boiling one, which is also a myth. Like you know, frogs absolutely would jump out of a pot that was being slowly made more hot. <laughs> but I don't think uh, I've heard that one. Oh, it's, it's just like slow yeah, boiling frog. Carrots are just wartime propaganda. Sonia, oh. you, can you talk a little bit about the gender roles in your novella? Uh, the role gender plays. So we decided, uh, like, we, we actually had a bit of talk going, like, we know that we want both of them to be women. But what does that mean <laughs> when we have all of time and space at our disposal? And uh, gender is is weird and complicated. Um, and I think that we, and, and also like, what do you do with gender when you can shape shift and have all of- And when you may have to shape shift in order to be present in different timelines or in different scenarios, impersonate people, things like exactly. that. Exactly. And I mean, what we came down on was just that we were like, you know, it, it's pretend, it's, it's totally legit to say that in the future, you know, gender will be perhaps incomprehensible to us, perhaps it won't exist, all of that sort of thing. Um, but we decided to be like, well, we just want them to to say she, <laughs> you know, we just we just want an instance where, like, I, I feel the need constantly in my life to, um, to write women talking to each other, you know, um, and to just, <clears throat> and to, to recognize how difficult that is a lot of the time, how much of the world is organized to prevent women from talking to each other um, and uh, and to prevent like, to, to you know, to, to when I say women here, I'm being like, you know, all women, obviously, like trans women, women of color, women of different backgrounds and um, just like, the idea that, um, but just like there, there are so many things that are calculated to keep us from talking to each other. Mm -hmm. uh, and this has been true across history and has really haunted me actually. Like the, the older I get, the more, um, like the, the more that I become very sensitive to seeing it, to seeing this problem in, wow, I just broke a pen as I was thinking, <laughs> whoops. <laughs> I have strong feelings, uh, but anyway. The rage um, emerges. Uh, yeah, yeah. True, yeah. So anyway, so we just we wanted it to be women talking to each other and we wanted readers to be able to, you know, take wh whatever women mean to them. They're going to have she her pronouns and they're going to change their bodies however they want, but they're always going to be women to themselves. So there, there was there was this sort of aspect of um, of kind of I, I don't know if I if I had the, the sort of uh, political vocabulary to talk through all of this when we started writing it, you know, but something mm -hmm. that definitely emerged as we were working was the desire on both of their parts and on both of their factions parts to sort of tease elements out of history that have been um, hidden or sort of, uh, sort of bulldozed over by our own conventional sort of mainstream narrative of history. So there are possibilities that are being resurrected and characters that are being highlighted that, uh, you know, are, aren't sort of, at least the mainstream like American high school education that I received. Um, and that was, it, it was interesting and I think correct that the timeline that we're in right now is not the right timeline for either of these. Um, either of these futures like that mm -hmm. it, it highlights the fact that time is and history is contested in a way um on the specific question of gender this is one area that i think where i think prose works very very well because we describe them red and blue in particular moments um, at times, but they do change their shape. They do change their bodies. They sort of flow from need to need. Um, they transform as the mission demands or as they, they themselves demand. And Red in the sort of second half of the book spends a significant amount of time kind of rewriting herself in a way. Hmm. And you get to um, inhabit a gender space while remaining um, 
in a way that plays very, very oddly with bodies, uh, I guess. Like when we're trying to uh, write a screenplay connected with the Time War story, we are left asking really intense questions about, you know, who plays this character? How does she move through space? Um, in, um, in the book, once the character has a name and a set of linguistic tags that refer to them, their body can be expansive, can be transformed, can, you know, swap all together, can, can disappear and yet the character remains. Um, I, I was wondering- Which has a lot of interesting implications. I'm sorry. I was wondering no, if you guys were going to do something like Altered Carbon, where they switch bodies like crazy. Mm. I haven't. Uh, wait, that is a book, right? Or, book. But yeah. then yeah. Yeah. The show on Netflix, right. a lot of naked people. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I, I am not familiar with it, but I, um, the, the other, you, you know, I'm, I'm, correct me if I'm wrong. Bleh. I'm sorry. My hands are all over the place. Um, <laughs> Correct me if I'm wrong about this, Max, but like at the outset, before we started writing, am I remembering correctly that we were at some point wondering whether they were going to uh, like be, like I, I have this vague memory of trying to decide whether we wanted to have them both be women or to have one be a woman and one be a man and then have them change throughout or not. But we decided we wanted it to be two women. Um, yeah, I think I think the, I, I am vaguely remembering that, but I don't know. This has been the last couple of weeks. It's like, do I, what is my memory even? Um, I, I, I think but, that there is a, a facet of like that decision that comes from the fact that we also really wanted them to be um, like knowing that any reader is going to bring contemporary society's yeah. experience to the book, we wanted to make sure that the power dynamics in the book were always of equality, like always of them being all the ways in which they are opposite from each other are also the ways in which they're equal, which is very difficult to do unless you have two people of like, uh, like of this, of the same gender ultimately. Like, and we have like- Certainly for, for like a presumptive 20th or early 21st century reader and for us as, you know, 21st exactly. century writers. Exactly, yeah. So so that was another facet of, of that, I think. And if I'm remembering this correctly, and I, I don't know, I hope I'm not making this up. I think part of one dimension of that conversation was that by having them as, if, if we had them like as, as a, as he and her, and then they swap. Not only do you end up kind of reinforcing a certain sort of heteronormativity, you're reinforcing a gender binary in a place that we didn't really want to. Like exactly. the implication of the story as it stands, I think, is that these are characters who change a lot and have a consistent identity to them, but they also transform. Yeah. Um, the implication of the opposite would would be that there's like that there are two states that you can be in and that felt sort of uncomfortable. Exactly. To us anyway. Yeah. I, I feel at least my memory and like I said, I'm, again, maybe I don't think I'm making it up. No, I think you're right. I think that's, I think that's absolutely right. We were basically like anytime, any, anything that involved them not being two women. Uh, it didn't feel right. Didn't feel right. It just didn't <laughs> yeah. feel right. And like, um, and like yeah no i'm i'm pretty sure i'm pretty sure we're right about that also i like the the things the things that led into us writing the book were also hella queer things like the like i introduced max to steven universe and he was like oh my god this reminds me so much of revolutionary girl utena and i was like what is that and he was like let me show you and so he introduced me to Revolu revolutionary girl utena uh which is perfect and it's just like they're just ladies loving each other a lot. And it was like, so, I mean, those things that we introduced each other to and that we both love very much were like in our hearts as we were approaching this project that we wanted to do together. So it, it felt of a piece with that. So what are you guys reading right now? Uh, what a good, what am I reading? <laughs> I'm reading Max's book right now. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> it's true. Uh, I'm reading Max's book that isn't out for a while. 
Um, but besides that, uh, like in terms of books that you can actually, uh, you know, purchase without time travel. Um, uh, God, what did I, what was, I'm so sorry. I'm, you, you literally asked me to prepare this question and I did not, did not do yeah, my I, I got some, I can cover it for you. Yeah. I can cover it for you. Go, um, go Max. Uh, so I, right now I'm working my way through the modern library Proust because, you know, hey, it's the quarantine. It's great. Um, and it's amazing. I This is the Moncrief, um, Kilmartin, and Wright translation, which it was recommended by a friend. It's extremely readable. Um, I am taking care of a one and some change year old right now. And the thing that I love about Proust that I really was not expecting is that you can sort of read him like a blog. Like each paragraph is its own kind of cool, complicated, involuted, nutty unit. If you're trying to get through a chapter, you're gonna be there for like a week. But if you're comfortable just putting something up and reading a page and really assimilating it and then putting it down, then you're gonna have a great time. Um, finished, oh God, I forget what the last guy's first name was, uh, Harper's Fall of Rome recently, which was a sort of view on the end of the Roman Empire um, and the plague of Justinian through epidemiology and climate change, which is a really, really fun, uh, not at all relevant read. Zero percent relevance. Um, and uh, out, not today, but a couple of days ago, Catherine Addison's yes. um, uh, Angel, Angel of the of Crows. The Crows. Angel yeah. of the Crows, yes, which is just enormous fun, especially if you're a Sherlock Holmes fan like I am. Um, so the full disclosure thing for me is that I have had a really, really, really hard time reading books during this pandemic, which feels cruel and terrible because no, there you're is. Not alone. A lot of I know. People. Yeah, you're not I've alone. been. I've been sort of like I hate to say that I'm heartened by this thing, which is terrible that other people are also experiencing. But knowing that I'm not alone has has been has been helpful uh, just in parsing because it like reading for the entirety of my life has probably been like one if not the most important thing to me for like a lot of reasons I've organized my life around reading and it's been very disorienting and strange to not feel able to read books which is the thing that I have been like you know that is comfort that is solace and all sorts of things I have been playing a lot of Animal Crossing um which man it's so it <laughs> It, Get them turn them. Does a thing. It's yeah. The only thing I know about Animal Crossing <laughs> that and that and Shing and Core's amazing installation work. Oh my God, Shing and Core's amazing installation work. Oh, Shing and Core is an absolutely brilliant, brilliant uh, artist who has been turning Animal Crossing into their medium uh, for recreating um, art and famous art installations. But in the game, it's it's truly phenomenal. Um, but I can tell you the last few things I read uh, that I loved. Um, I extremely loved uh, Tochi Onyebuchi's um, Riot Baby, which was a, a like a just like his prose style in that book is just like I think like I I'm just gonna quote myself having reviewed the book and say it's like reading Hot Diamonds. It's just like it's searing. It, the clarity of it is so gorgeous. Okay. It's just incredible. Um, <clears throat> the um, I read Nino Cipri's uh, Finna, which is, or Finna, I'm not sure how it's pronounced, but it is uh, F-I-N-N-A, it's a Tor.com novella. Oh, these are both Tor.com novellas. God, I read so many Tor.com novellas, I really need to change that up. Um, but uh, it's, it's basically like, what if there were a portal to other dimensions in not Ikea? Um, and it's, it's super queer and very fun but also very touching and very moving and uh ultimately about how like people who have broken up with each other can find friendship in the wake of their breakup which is a, a kind of storytelling i very very rarely see um and it, i found it just just incredibly moving um and uh i loved um i loved shorefall uh the second book in the um uh, what is it called? In, in Robert Jackson Bennett's oh, Tivan the Foundry series. Side. Yeah, the, the yeah. sequel to Foundry Side. Um, I super loved. Um, and I really uh, liked. Yeah. Um, sorry, go for it. Oh no, yeah. mm -hmm. so, yeah. I was like, just kind of like running, literally running through. What what have I been? 
reading. I really yeah. like P. Jelly Clark's Master of Gin, but that's not going to be out for a little while yet. But definitely yes. watch for it. And I, I'm sure, I, based on that, that the Haunting of Tramp Car 15 and the other ones that Jen and Cairo are both really great. Yes. Okay. So I extremely loved The Haunting of Tramp Car 015. Like, I. And I'm so happy that I, I recently got the opportunity to be on a virtual panel with Jelly uh, and and actually tell him how much I loved the book because I, I specifically loved it. Like it's, it's it's a super fun, very charming romp in an alternate um, uh, like early 20th century Cairo. Uh, and it's, but the thing about it that keeps blowing me away, I just like, is that he gets, he gets the Arabic so right. Like he's just, there, there's a way of of like balancing the representation of Arabic in an English text that is very tricky to do, and that usually I'm super allergic to because if I see someone trying to like say <clears throat> throw Arabic names into a text in English, it usually ends up having this problem that I think of as the 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 problem, which is you're going to talk about like you're going to talk about the al Hamadiya market. And it's like, no, Al means the. You can't talk about the the market. I, I just refuse. I refuse to read this. I'm sorry. It's not, and it's not to say that it's on I'm only shrugging because English has the La Brea Tartic. So, like, <laughs> what are you, what's he going to do? <laughs> That's true. The the tar tar pit. <laughs> You know, I, it's, it's not, it, we're not a good language. I, I apologize profusely. <laughs> Grr. So it's just like that sort of thing tends, to, it just throws me out of a narrative. It makes me feel like it's not written specifically for me. It's written for people who don't speak Arabic, which is fine, you know, but in this case, it felt like it was written for me. And what was that the name of that again? Happy. Oh, sorry. What was the name of that again? Uh, the Haunting of Tramcar 015. Okay. Um, it was uh, nominated for, uh, for the Nebula this year. I forget if it's on the Hugo. I think it is also, I forget. I don't have it at the tip of my fingers, but it's it's phenomenal. I super loved it and I highly recommend it. Um, I also read um, Aliyah Don Johnson's Trouble the Saints uh, recently and haven't oh, had I haven't read a, that one yet. Is it, it's, is it, good? It, um, it like her prose is so lush and so beautiful. Uh, and it is in the same sort of, like it's, it's doing in some ways, um, in some ways, a similar thing to Riot Baby, but in a different time period, uh, where that kind of thing where you're you're looking at, um, you're trying to reconcile the nightmare of Black history with the existence of magic. Like, you know, the, 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 that kind of persnickety question of how are you going to write people having magic and still have our history be what it is, you know? Um, and it does some really, really elegant and startling and amazing things with that. Um, and uh, and it was like, it, like the, the voices in that book are really just haunting and, and gorgeous. So, uh, yeah. So I had one <clears throat> last question. Uh, love to know how much Romeo and Juliet illusion would play it. Plan versus discovered. Um, well, initially, like, there, I wanted the title of the book to be uh, These Violent Delights, which was a, like, and, and we were playing with the idea of having, like, a quote, like, that, the, these violent, uh, what is it, um, these violent delights have violent and have violent ends uh, and stuff like something, something loathsome in its own deliciousness, um, that sort of thing. And, and then we decided not to for a bunch of reasons. One, there was already a book called These Violent Delights that was a romance novel that was very different. Um, so we decided super not to. We went through like 35 different possible titles before landing on uh, This Is How You Lose the Time War. So, but in terms of illusion, uh, I think it was all always kind of there. I, what do you what do you remember, Max? I mean, I think it was discovered in that we didn't really talk about it as Romeo and Juliet thing. Like that was never one of our touchstones going in. But we both obviously read all of the Shakespeare um, and were familiar with it. So yes, 
And I feel like was, if, it was, if it were conscious, then there would like be a Mercutio, you know, like you're not going to go into writing a Romeo and Juliet story and not have Mercutio in there. Or... That is very true. I mean, I think it was it, like the, the you know, two houses, both alike in dignity uh, is kind of, it's not that either character is the Romeo or the Juliet. I think it is yeah. just like the, the fact of opposing camps and uh, and trying to, like fight and then not fight each other um, is in there. Although there is a part like where like when when Blue is deciding whether or not to um, eat the poison letter and stuff, <clears throat> where what I had in my head at that point was a play by Anne Marie MacDonald, uh, who is a phenomenal Canadian playwright called uh, Good Night Desdemona, Good Morning Juliet. And the premise of that play is that there is an academic who's dissertation, I think it's her dissertation, um, is that Romeo and Juliet and Othello are actually comedies, but there is a crucial comedic element that has been misplaced, like through the, the archive of them. And, uh, and then like through shenanigans, uh, she ends up being in the world of those plays and she herself becomes the comedic element and ends up like, so there, there's a line in the in when Blue is in uh, uh, in a uh, English Renaissance basically, uh, and she says like you know the, the the timelines in which Romeo and Juliet is a tragedy versus a comedy, and like that was absolutely in my head. Um, but other than that, I I don't think we belabored it too much in talking about it. All right. Well, guys, this was freaking awesome. Thank you. This was so much Thank fun. You. Thank Likewise, you so much for having great. us. We didn't even get to talk about Anchor Watt, but that's okay. <laughs> oh, do we know how to like, write another story? book? Yeah, that's true. <laughs> All right, guys. So um, if you're watching, I highly recommend that you buy this book. Um, maybe we can figure out a way to get book plates. I mean, why not? Absolutely. Can, yeah. yeah. So um, I posted a link in the comments if you want to buy it from us. Um, please support your local independent bookstore. You don't have to support us. We would prefer you support us, but you did reach out and find your local independent bookstore and get a copy of This Is How You Lose the Time War. So thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. I'll say, too, if anyone has questions that mm -hmm. they like want to ask, uh, I am for my sins probably going to be on Twitter <laughs> for a while. Yeah, at least until, yeah. So yeah, if if there are any questions that are burning that you need answered and stuff like that, you can um, hit me up there and uh, I'm happy to do that. All right. Well, thanks guys. This is Read It Again Bookstore in Suwannee, Georgia. And uh, well, have a good night. Bye. Have a great night. Thanks Take a lot. care. Thanks.